Our final speaker tonight is a graduate of Boston College, where he studied English and pre-medicine. He was inspired to become a physician by the Jesuit motto, Cura Personalis, or Care for the Entire Person. After graduation, he joined the Jesuit Volunteer Corps to serve as an outreach specialist for the chronically homeless in Washington, D.C. This experience with the people at the margins of our society taught him how to live a truly courageous life and serves as the inspiration for his talk. Please welcome Michael Serzin, class of 2015. Everything we need to change the world exists within this room. But how do you explain how some people are successful in creating change where others are not? As a member of our audience tonight, why does the world need you to change it? And lastly, what needs to be changed? Well, it's been said that we're living in some pretty dire times. We have an obesity epidemic plaguing our younger generation and Alzheimer's dementia diseases, which challenge how we care for our older generation. And for everyone in between, we have an insurance system with paradoxically higher costs and lower satisfaction rates for patients and physicians alike. These occur within the context of a society with a widening gap between the haves and the have-nots, a war on terror, war on drugs, war on poverty. And yet, despite all these problems, we have reasons to hope, um, inspiring leaders of past and present times. Certainly, the great Dr. Martin Luther King comes to mind as a man who had the courage of his convictions to stand on the mall in front of 250,000 people and declare his dream, that his children would one day grow up in a nation where they'd be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Some of you may also be familiar with Dr. Paul Farmer, who, while attending medical school, made frequent trips bringing supplies to one of the poorest countries on the planet, Haiti. And after graduating, founded Partners in Health, a nonprofit dedicated to not only providing the most essential medical needs, but also some of the most complex regimens for tuberculosis, HIV, and other infectious diseases to the third world because it was Dr. Farmer's dream that quality of healthcare should be determined solely on response to human suffering, regardless of socioeconomic status. And yet I fear all too often when we look at these inspiring leaders, we elevate them so much so into a superhuman stratosphere that it's like trying to understand the sun by simply staring up at it. And after a few fleeting moments when we start to understand how the sun lights the world, it hurts and we're forced to look away. This draws us into impossible tension between having an increasing awareness of suffering in the world and a decreasing sense that we can actually do something about it. So from then on, we put down our heads, put on our blinders, and charge ahead. Change is no longer for us, but it occurs at podiums or on the pages of a New York Times bestseller on the scale of thousands of people worldwide. Now, it's no stretch of the imagination to think that most people in this room have seen one of these signs at one point or another in their life. You've seen them outside of subway stations. You've seen them on park benches as you're running from one meeting to the next. And the individuals holding these signs are sometimes old and sometimes young. And sometimes loud, ranting apocalyptics, telling you that the world is in fact going to end today. And other times, they stare silently, just hoping somebody might notice them. And assuming most people have seen one of these signs at one point or another, I can absolutely guarantee that the same two things happen to every person in this room on seeing these signs. And the first is a realization, and the second is a choice. Now, on seeing one of these signs, um, what we've all realized is that, is that the individual, the man or woman holding one of these signs, is a human being, not all too different from ourselves. And by walking by, either reading their sign or listening to their plea, we get the opportunity to feel what they feel. Whether that's a sense of humor, or a shared sense of hope, or sadness, or even anger. And on coming to this realization, we arrive at the all-important choice that I've come to appreciate as the panhandling dilemma, whereby the next time we see a homeless man or woman, we can quicken our pace or cross the street to avoid the interaction, 
which is inevitably followed by feelings of guilt and frustration. Alternatively, we can have our money ready or give extra food or write a check at the end of the year. And yet, homelessness still exists. Well, I'm not here tonight to tell you what you should do the next time you see a homeless person. But what I would like to do is to share with you the story of a man who profoundly changed the way that I think about this dilemma and the way that I lead my life. Now with this and many other questions echoing in my head, I decided that I would take a year and fully immerse myself in my optimistic ideals by living and working with those at the, at the margins of our society in Washington, DC. And it was one of the best decisions I've made in my short 24 years here. But before going, I started to reflect and think to myself, I was entering a situation that I had no role in causing. And furthermore, even with my degree from a top academic institution, I didn't have any of the tools to adequately address. So from this perspective, poverty existed before I went and would certainly outlast my time there. So what was the point of going in the first place? Well, So I distinctly remember the day that I met Jeffrey because it was on, it was on uh, the request of somebody who worked at the kitchen with me. She was concerned about a man who was outside and yeah, he drank a lot, but she was concerned that of what might happen to him if he kept sleeping outside night after night as it got colder into the winter. And we said, absolutely, we'd love to. So after our morning rounds, we went up, uh, packed up our van and drove up the hill to the public housing complex. And I remember jumping out of the van, going around the back of the all brick building. And as we approached the stairwell, I started to make out the frame of a man in an overcoat passed out under the stairs. And so we approached the man and said, um, excuse me, excuse me, sir, you okay? Nothing. So we inched a little bit closer through the doorway, said, excuse me. Excuse me, sir. And all of a sudden, his eyes popped open, and he shot up against the cold concrete. We said, no, 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 please, sir, sir, it's OK. Um, my name is Mike. This is Jeff. We're not here to hurt you. We're not the police. Um, somebody who lives here asked us to check up on you. Are, are you OK? I think once the words not and police entered the air between us, <laughs> the tension came from about a 10 maybe to an 8, so still kind of high. And so the man jumped up, and he said, yeah, I'm OK. I'm OK. Um, I'm Jeffrey, and then, what do you want again? Well, it's nice to meet you, Jeffrey. Uh, again, my name is Mike, and this is Jeff. We're outreach workers, and um, we do outreach with the homeless and help people get into housing or jobs or treatment programs. Is that something you might be interested in? Yeah, yeah, that's what I need. That's what I need, absolutely. I said, all right, well, great. Well, why don't you meet me at Division Avenue at 11 a.m. tomorrow? and we'll see what we can do together. And so I wrote the appointment on the back of my business card, gave him some sandwiches, and shook his hand. And as I turned my back to walk back to the van, I thought to myself, maybe 50-50 chances he shows up tomorrow, and probably even less chance that he's ready to get the help that he needs for his addiction. The next morning, we rolled on a Division Avenue, and as we turned the corner, I squinted my eyes and my eyes popped open because there, sitting at the corner in his overcoat, was Jeffrey. And before jumping out of the van, I paused to ask myself, with all the odds stacked against him, why did I feel the need to add my own? Couldn't I, of all people, have known better? Over the course of the next week, I get to know Jeffrey and we start to work together. And we get him IDs, we get him in the shelter, and we get him a TB test, police clearance, all the things necessary to enter inpatient treatment. And then the night before he was set to enter the program, I was driving him back to the shelter, and I could tell he was having second thoughts, as anybody who's been drinking for the last 20 years would naturally have. Finally, Jeffrey just turns to me and he goes, you know, Mike, do you think I can actually do this? And that question gave me pause, because for the longest time, my knee-jerk response was, oh, of course you can. You know, you may have to do a couple of days of detox, but then you'll do treatment, and then 
once you come out, we'll get you into job, uh, job training and transitional housing, you know, walking him through the steps of what it would take and trying to convince him, probably also trying to convince myself that there was a proven path to recovery. But for some reason, that overly optimistic cookie cutter response just didn't feel right. So I turned back and I said, you know, Jeffrey, I don't know. Addiction is a very complex, chronic disease that I'm just starting to scratch the surface of understanding. But what I believe is that you and I are here doing what we think is best to get you the help that you need. Jeffrey just kind of shook his head, got the window, and turned back saying, I guess the feeling's mutual. So the next morning, Jeffrey enters inpatient treatment, and I don't hear from him for about six months until I get a phone call one day. He goes, hey, this, uh, this Mike Servan? Sir I go, yeah, this is Mike. Who's calling? It's, hey, it's Jeffrey. Uh, I'm searching my memory. I'm thinking, uh, Jeffrey who? Goes, Man, you know Jeffrey <laughs> from Lincoln Heights. Duh. <laughs> Jeffrey, how the hell are you, man? How have you been? Man, been doing great. Listen, I just finished six months clean and sober. They're having a graduation ceremony for us. I want you to be there. Absolutely, I'm there. Later that week, I find myself a front row seat in the cafeteria full of folding chairs. And um, I think as long as I live, I'll never forget when it was Jeffrey's turn to stand up and speak. And he gets up to the podium and he says, just like to start by thanking the good Lord for sending me an angel in the form of Jeff and Mike from DC Central Kitchen. Because they reached out to me. They believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And they started me on the road to recovery. And Jeffrey's story is all but just beginning. But for this stitch in time, because of his determination and the bridging of our journeys, he was liberated from the chains of homelessness and addiction. And he looks forward to contributing to his family and to his community on his terms, and no longer the terms of his addiction. Now, bursting out on the Columbia Road that sunny afternoon, my mind was racing almost as fast as my heart was beating, and mostly because I was recounting Jeffrey's story over and over again in my head, and mostly because he used that one word. Angel. Now, I didn't set out to be an angel that day. And in fact, I know I made many more mistakes and got easily frustrated in my case management with hundreds of other clients. And as a believer in angels, I'm hope, I hope they don't see, walk away from those they seek to help with my 50-50 attitude. But what I did try to do is go out every day with an open heart to forming relationships with those around me, an attitude to embrace complexity and challenges, and the hope that because of the bridging of our journeys, both our lives might be enriched. And I suspect this is exactly what Drs. Farmer and King had in mind when they decided to live out their dreams. And the miracle of our lives is that we have the capacity for feelings that nobody before us or after us will ever have. I think it's what makes us most fully and uniquely human. Because plenty of people will grow up in the same hometowns, graduate the same prestigious institutions, and walk around with the same letters after their name, but nobody gets to feel what you feel. Nobody gets to fall in love with people and challenges in quite the same way that you are. Nobody's called to act where you are. And I propose that it's the extent to which we listen to these emotions and infuse them into our actions that determines our ability to lead meaningful lives both for ourselves and for those around us. We should all count ourselves immensely lucky to be entering a profession that above all else affords the opportunity to make a difference in the life of the patient in front of you. Some call medicine a profession, but I believe it's much more than that. It's a calling. And rather than turning away from the luminous glow of past leaders, use their light to improve your vision, to better see where you can make a difference. Use their energy to persevere when fear and cynicism all but extinguish your hope. Write the research proposal with a question that just captures your mind with imagination. 
take the global health trip, speak the truth in advocacy, or instruct students in excellent medicine. Now, we will stumble, embarrass ourselves, and disappoint those around us. But as a formerly homeless man once had the courage to suggest, we might also be angels that inspire each other to say, we will work for change, making our dreams a reality in this world. And if we fail in all other things, let us succeed in knowing that we tried to practice medicine with full minds and full hearts for it may very well be the only evidence that we ever existed at all. Thank you.